I'd like to talk about education, the importance of education and the future of education, and how education is changing and needs to change in order to meet the demands of a world which is rapidly changing. And my theme today will be that we need radical change in what we call education. It's fair to say that without education, humanity could never have reached this level of development that we have reached in science and technology in economy in governance. Ed education is really the thing that has helped us move out of the forest uh, as forest dwellers thousands of years ago uh, and create civilization. One way of thinking about education is it's the system by which human beings gather all the past experience of our forefathers over centuries, millennium. We take the essence of that knowledge that we've gained in the past and we pass it on to the next generation in a concentrated form, in an essence, so that the next generation can start off where we left off rather than going and repeating all of the mistakes and having to rediscover, reinvent the wheel, as we said. It's education that really distinguishes us human beings from all the other species on the planet. But up until recently, our society was changing very slowly. There wasn't that much difference between one generation and another. Life changed slowly. So an educational system that could slowly adapt to those changes was sufficient. That's not true anymore. Today, the whole world is changing so quickly, not only moving quickly, but changing, developing, evolving so quickly, that our system, there's a growing gap between what the next generation needs to know and what it is we're teaching them. You can even say there's a time warp because the, the teachers and the textbooks who are giving the education today, most of them, many of them, were educated 20, 30 years ago by teachers and in textbooks that were by then uh, uh, developed 20, 30 years earlier. So there's an increasing time gap. And what we see around us is the world is changing so rapidly. It's only 27 years since the end of the Cold War. It's only about 23 years since the beginning founding of the internet. Much of the ideas that we're teaching in our educational system are of the long past, are of things that are no longer relevant. If you listen to or read the studies by McKinsey World Economic Forum about what's coming in the future. Technologically, I mean, what they call the fourth industrial revolution, the new technologies that are emerging, robotics, nanotechnology, and so forth. According to the studies, in another 30 years, 50 to 80% of the jobs that exist, this is in, in the countries like America, my country, won't exist anymore. So then it raises the question, what are we educating our youth for? What are we preparing them for? Are we training them for jobs that will disappear in the next five or 10 years? Are we really equipping them in the way necessary to be able to meet the challenges and the opportunities of the future? So in that sense, education is the best instrument we have to prepare ourselves for the future. But the orientation of our education is to the past. And it's not just the content of the education like that. It's also the methods that we're using. Today, if you look at how university education is run all over the world, we're following a method 
that's about a thousand years old. From the time of the University of Bologna was founded in 1077 in Italy, uh, at a time when this is 400 years before the printing press. Now, how would you communicate knowledge from one generation to the other before there were printed books? At a time when books were so precious, they had to be written by hand, sometimes take a, light, a, a year for a human being to copy one book. They were so precious, they would be chained to the shelves of the library so nobody would steal it. So we had a logical system at that time. If you think about it, it was logical. Somebody who can read and write, which itself was rare, who's read the books, who had access to the books, you gather around, other young people gather around, and he lectures to them and tells them what he knows. And that was called education. Today, we have hundreds of millions of books available. We have books available for free on our mobile phones, on our uh, tablets, uh, on the internet. We have access. Each of us has access to more information than any human being in history had had up until about 20 years ago. And yet we're still acting in a world as if information is scarce. Information is not scarce. Rather, we have a, a glut, an, a superabundance of information. And if we try to pump all of this information into the heads of our kids, the next generation, we're simply going to fill it to the point where uh, uh, there's no more capacity to think. So what have we done about it? How have we responded to this tremendous growth in the amount of information available? We're still using the same method. It's a broadcast method. One person talks, everybody listens. Uh, we're still relying on the oral tradition to a very large extent at a time when we have not only textbooks and online, we have audio, video, we have motion picture, we have so many ways in which to communicate knowledge. We all, the saying is a picture is worth a thousand words, but we're still using a thousand words when we could be using a picture to convey reality. So this is a time when we need a radical change in our education system. And there's much more to it than that. Let me share with you some research findings that have been done at the international level uh, on how we learn as human beings. And this information is the result of uh, social studies, psychological studies of learning that involved about 80 million people in, in many different countries. If we listen to a lecture the average retention rates that we come from listening to the lecture over time, we remember about 5% of what we've heard in the lecture. If we read a book out of our interest and study it, our long-term retention is about 10%. If we discuss it with other people, have a discussion about it, it goes up to maybe 25% we'll remember over time. If we practically use that information, I mean we have a projects, we do problem solving, we do case studies, we do uh, implementation of so, then our learning goes up to about 50%. But the maximum learning we get is when we teach others. And then it goes up to about 90%. So essentially, we have an educational system which is maximizing the learning of the instructors, not the students. And everyone who teaches knows this. That's why people enjoy teaching. Because no matter how many times you teach the same subject to new people with inquiry, especially when people ask questions, you, the teacher learns more. But what about the students? This is what we know. This is scientifically proven, but we're still using the old methodology. I come from a place called Napa in Calif Northern California, 
And about 20 years ago, the city of Napa decided that it wanted to try something new in education. So the city called together 20 top companies in the region. This is the northern end of Silicon Valley. And asked the companies, can you advise us how we should change the educational system so that it could be more effective than it is today? And they got many very good practical recommendations from this. But the number one recommendation was, you see, for 12 years in school, you are teaching children to compete with each other and work by themselves. When we hire a student, when we hire a young person into the company, they almost never do anything by themselves. We want them to work in teams and cooperate with each other. We're teaching competition when what we really need is cooperation. And in fact, learning, like any human activity, is a social activity. We learn best when we interact with others. So in Napa, they started a new school called the New Technology High School, and they changed the paradigm. They broke up the students into groups of four students. And the teacher became a facilitator. And the students are learning each subject in groups, teaching each other. We call it peer-to-peer -peer learning. And the results were so fantastic that now there are a hundred and more than 120 school districts in the United States where they're introducing this, they call it the 21st century uh, model of education, where they're trying to completely flip the paradigm around. Now, what is the change that I'm talking about? First of all, it's a change from a passive system where education is about listening to an active system, an active system of learning, where the students are going out, learning a subject, and sharing it with each other. It's a shift from a competitive system where the person on my right and my left is competing with me for the highest marks to a cooperative system in which we're all helping each other. We're all learning together. And each one of, somebody's better in history, somebody in geography, somebody in engineering, uh, somebody in mathematics, and we learn to learn from each other and help each other, and we build social relationships. We build teamwork. So a shift from competition uh, to cooperation. It's a shift from the education coming from somebody else, coming to us, to us going out and seeking the knowledge. And of course, I think most people are familiar now with the way technology is changing education now that we have the online education, now that it's possible for thousands and thousands of courses are being created by top educators, imagine how wonderful it would be if every student in the world had access to the best quality teachers in the world on that subject where it doesn't depend on whether you're lucky to get a good teacher for a particular subject. You can listen and receive uh, instruction from the best teachers in the world. And I don't mean by that just the most knowledgeable teacher. Because teaching is not just about knowledge. Teaching is about communicating. Teaching is about relating to the to each other. Teaching is about awakening the interest, the curiosity, making the student think. Imagine if everybody in the world could have access to that. And we could choose. We could choose from the top hundred uh, teachers teaching geometry or teaching philosophy or, or, or uh, English literature or Ukrainian language or whatever it is. And we could have that education in any language that we wanted. Because now with the computer technology, it can be translated. And I'm not saying that that means we should close the schools and do away with the schools. I'm saying that 
there's still a role for the teacher. There, we need teachers, but not we don't need the teacher to be broadcasting information. We need the teachers to be working with the students to help awaken our curiosity, to help ask us questions, to get us talking and interacting with each other. So the best, most successful learning today in the world is where we can get information by ourselves, but then we interact with each other. Uh, we share that information, we exchange it, we discuss it, we apply it. Then we get the best quality instruction, but we also get the opportunity to work with it and think with it ourselves. So these are some of the keys, but there's much more to it. Essentially, what we're talking about is not just a change in the pedagogy in the classroom. We're talking about a whole change in the purpose of the education. Because the purpose of the education up until now has been, there's a certain amount of valuable information which we have to give to the student. Like a vaccine, we want to vaccinate them or pump it into the head uh, until it's full. So you can become an engineer or a chemist, a physicist, or an economist. But now we know that whatever we teach the kids today, in five or ten years, it's going to be out of date. And they're going to have to be learning throughout their whole life. So more important than teaching them and pumping something in is to teach them how to learn. To learn how to learn so they can continue to learn and improve themselves throughout their life. The old paradigm is you go to school for a certain number of years, you become something. You become an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, a, 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 an economist or whatever it is, and you go on practicing for the rest of your life. But all the research says that's not the future. The most important thing that we need to give our youth is not a particular professional knowledge. The most important thing we need to give them is the capacity to learn and the capacity to act. So I'm talking about a shift, the fundamental shift from education is about the subject to education is about the student. It's not to educate for a subject, it's to educate the person. And that raises another fundamental question. What is it that we should educate the person for? If you talk to top companies in the world, companies like Google, I'm thinking, they will tell you that it's true that they hire very bright people from top universities, but they'll also tell you that if you look at the students, the kids who stay with them, who stay with the company more than a year or so, you cannot predict it from the grades they have gotten in school. It's not the brightest person who got the best test scores that is a success at Google. The most important thing that they're looking for in order to be a success is the capacity to work with other people the capacity to work as part of a team, the capacity to think out of the box. Now think about that, because most of our education is telling us what to think. This is what we should know. This is true. This is knowledge. And we're conditioning our, children, our kids for 12 years or 16 years or more to learn and memorize what they should know. But the companies know that we don't know what we need to know in the future. We can't memorize the knowledge we're going to need in the future. What we need are people who can think for themselves, who can think independently, who can think differently than the past. I went into Intel Corporation. I'm a business consultant. And I went into Intel Corporation some years ago. And I was asking them about how they're managing Rapid change, very rapid change in a fast-growing industry where technology is growing so quickly. And they said, one of the things we do is we give a course to all our employees called Constructive 
confrontation. I said, I don't really understand that. What do you mean by constructive confrontation? Why would you want people to confront one another? I thought you said uh, your, your employees need to work together. And they said, the problem is that the knowledge is changing so quickly that somebody who came into our company four or five years ago as a, a, a very brilliant young engineer who's designing new chips, five years later their knowledge is out of date. And we hire new students who have just come in from uh, the top schools with new knowledge because they've been studying while uh, our people have been working. And the young students who are five, ten years younger than the experienced, capable people in the company, when, they, when the older people give ideas, the young student says, that's a foolish idea, that's an old idea. And of course, the older people get upset. How can you tell me I'm foolish? What do you know? You're just out of college. I'm an expert. I designed the last Pentium chip or something like that. How can you talk to me that way? And so they have to educate both the older people and the younger people. They have to educate the older people to understand that knowledge is changing so quickly, we have to be ready to learn from the younger people who know something more because they've been studying while we've been working. And they educate the younger people to know if you come in and start talking to the guy who's 10 years older than you and say you don't know anything of what you're talking about, they're only going to be angry with you and try to find fault with you. So you have to learn how to communicate uh, in a way that is not offensive, not disturbing to them. And he, they said, this is a real problem for us. So what are we doing in our educations, teaching knowledge over decades or centuries of knowledge of the past when it's no longer enough? And it's, there's too much of it also. And that comes to another problem we have. How, you know, I'm sure you've heard because it's common knowledge that now the amount of new information that's being generated is so enormous that in a few years we acquire more information than we've acquired over the last century or the last millennium. How do we cope with that? How is the present system coping with it? The present system is coping with it by increasing specialization. Yes, there's too much information uh, in, uh, uh, in this field for one person to learn anymore, so let's divide it into two fields or three fields or four fields, and we'll have specialists in each field. So in the U.S. universities today, we teach over 1,000 different specialties. That sounds like a common sense approach. Uh, then we got thousand specialists who each know something in depth. The problem is that life is not divided into small, thin uh, compartments like that. In everything in our life is interconnected. Imagine that you go to a doctor uh, and uh, you want surgery or you want advice about your health condition and he says, well, I can only tell you about your kidneys uh, uh, if you, if, uh, but I don't know about your heart and your liver and your lungs and your brain and your nervous system. And in fact, that's what happens today. But if you ever really look at the human body, the idea of a nervous system, a respiratory system, a metabolic system is only an abstraction. There is no such thing. There's one body that everything is interconnected with everything else. You can't divide them and say, we're only going to deal with this and not with this. That's why there's so many side effects in modern medicine. Because when we deal with it as if it's a separate thing and forget the interactions with it. And this is happening in all our fields of knowledge today. Our economic theory forgets that we have problems of ecology, that it's connected to political science, it's connected to psychology. So the more and more we divide reality into small parts, the more and more we not only get knowledge, but we become increasingly ignorant. We have an old proverb, I'm sure it exists in Ukrainian also, 
we see the tree, but we miss the forest. We see the part, but we miss the whole. And that's what we're doing in our educational system. We're teaching people to be experts in a particular tree and not see the whole forest, not see the whole of interconnectedness of life. And that's why our knowledge is less and less effective in really helping us. Our, every time we solve a problem, we create three more problems because we miss the fact that everything's interconnected. So we need an educational system that helps us connect things across and not just go down deep like a microscope to look at each subject as a specialization. So that means we need radical change in our educational system. And I was saying that we need an educational system where the single goal is not to teach a subject. The single goal is to help the personality of the student develop so that they can be more successful in life. And that means not only to have a knowledge, not only to be able to think creatively, not only to be able to solve problems, but to know how to deal with other people, to know how to organize work, to know how to manage life situations, to know how to manage their own emotions, their own uh, uh, grow uh, experiences as they grow up. So we are talking about a shift in paradigm from subject-centered to person-centered education. And the reason I'm mentioning this today this is a problem all over the world. This is not a, just for Ukraine by any means. We have this problem in the United States. We have it in Europe. We have it in Asia, everywhere. But there's a real need for a change, and more and more people are recognizing it. Do you know that most of the top people in Silicon Valley, they don't put their children into the schools? They're starting new schools because and we have millions of students now who are not in the schools because their parents feel that the school is creating ignorance. It's instead of really teaching the kids how to learn, we don't have a real alternative yet. So we've got thousands and thousands of experimental schools being started. We're looking for new ways to learn. I'm mentioning that here because I think this is an opportunity for Ukraine. It's not only a need, but it's also an opportunity. Because the whole world is looking for new answers. Ukraine has to reinvent its educational system because like many other countries, you have an educational system that was essentially inherited from the Soviet period where the knowledge was in, uh, communicated and all. You have to rebuild and modernize. But why, what's the idea of building for the next three years or the next five years? Why not design your educational system to really be the educational system of the future? That's an opportunity. That's an opportunity not only to give a high quality education here. Imagine Ukraine becoming an educational hub for the world where young people from all over the world want to come to Ukraine because here we get the people who are really thinking about the future of education and what we need for the future. Really thinking about the student and not just the subject. Really helping develop the student. So you'd be doing something that's not only very valuable for your own youth, but you'd be doing something that would be as great an export product as uh, your food commodities or your IT industry or anything like that. It's a growth industry. Uh, the US every year earns about $20 billion from uh, education, foreigners coming for education in the US. Uh, that's about twice uh, what Ukraine is getting uh, from the IT exports now. So uh, education could be a great growth business also as well as serving the needs of the people. Thank you.